Hey. Um, so my name's Ryan Stevenson, and I'm art director at the game studio Rare. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the art of adventure on Sea of Thieves. Um, I'm going to be covering some of the visual pillars that we made during the making of the project, also showing you some of the early work around creating the visuals and some things that have never been seen before. Um, so to begin with, who in the room has actually played Sea of Thieves? Ah, saying ah. Nice, very party. Um, so, well, release day was actually yesterday. Brilliant. Thank you. So to begin with, I thought I'd, um, as a reminder to everyone, is to start with the launch gameplay trailer. So, um, to talk about the art journey of Sea of Thieves, I need to tell you a little bit about the studio first, and also about how we came to make this part adventure game. So, I joined the studio 17 years ago, but that's nothing compared to Rare, who's been around for over 30 years now. And we have a rich history of games with a wide range of themes, so hopefully you're familiar with some of these games. Um, and as you can see, that there's a, a wide variety of different genres, and there's also different themes within it. Um, as you can see, we like to experiment, and I think it also speaks to the fact we like to change what we work on and how we work at key moments throughout, through, the, through the years. And one of those interesting moments came in 2014, when we were just finishing the Connect Sports Rival series of sports games, and um, we realized that the following year, 2015, was actually going to be the 30th anniversary of Rare. So we worked on Rare Replay, which was a collection of games of 30, 30 games from 30 years. And it really, those games really speak to the history of the studio and the character and the, and the charm of the studio, I think. Um, but, so we had this eye on the past. But at the same time as looking at the past, we wanted to think of what the future was going to hold for Rare. So a small group of us came together to define that future, to try and think out what was going to be our next game and Project Athena was born. Well, kind of. Um, so when we first started Project Athena, we had no preconceived ideas what it could be. It could be a, anything from a racing game to an RPG, but what we did have was a design vision. And that design vision was for a group-shaped narr narrative. So a group-shaped narrative to us is a game in where the experience of the player changes depending on who they meet within the world, and the interaction between those players. Uh, a game where natural conversation was going to be key, and also with a, that would cause a wider range of emotions as they played the game. Um, and also, um, so we, we did all that, but we still didn't know what the game was going to be. So we did have that design vision, but we still didn't know what to do. So to solve this, we actually created a whole bunch of one sheets that went upon the walls around the studio. And these one sheets were one page design documents, and this is the one that we produced for Sea of Thieves. And we had hundreds of these up on the walls, um, but it wasn't until this one went up that we realized that we'd found our muse. The idea of a group of players um, working together and communicating to sail a ship and meeting other crews within the world was just perfect for a, a shared world narrative. We also realized it gave us a world where um, the players would be able to understand the tools and the world quite simply. So what do you do with a compass or what do you do with a treasure map? 
um, it's pretty obvious and it, it plays into all those genres that, and films that you've seen over the years. Um, and there's one other thing that we really liked about this idea. And that's the game studio, that's rare. So we're actually in the middle of England, nestled about as far away from water as you possibly can. And the thing we really liked about this idea is that it's no secret, even though we're about as far away from sea as you can get, we love pirates. We've managed to crowbar pirates into most titles that we've made over the years. Uh, my particular favorite is the fact that we've got a zombie pirate and grabbed by the ghoulies. Now, that's a haunted house game. There is no reason why pirates should exist in it, but we still crowbarred it in. Um, so yeah, so that's the reason why. Um, and we just love them. So we had a vision and we had a theme that we wanted to go after. Um, so the project could really begin. So at the start, we separated it into two different streams. One was going to be creating a lo-fi gameplay prototype. This prototype actually was um, this rich experience that would feature all of the, the features that you actually see within the game that you've been playing today. Um, and that actually stayed with us for a long period during the dev. And the other stream that we, we created was the visual development stream, so my area. And whenever I start, like to start a project, I like to start it by defining some art goals and challenges. So right at the start, um, we realized we had two main goals that we wanted to go after with Sea of Thieves. Goal number one was to create a modern rare game. So we wanted to create a game that spoke to the magic and charm of the studio, uh, the playful nature of where we make games. And also, we wanted something that would redefine visually what AAA meant to us as a studio. So ra a rather lofty ambition. And also, from a gameplay point of view, we knew that Sea of Thieves would be a game where there was going to be a lot of humor. We wanted to capture that um, old, rare kind of humor within it as well. So, and the visuals needed to match the tone. The second goal, which was really important, was to create a timeless visual art style. So um, the idea was a timeless visual art style would avoid being outdated by advances in technology, and it would scale quite nicely over different platforms. So we're going to be making a game that would be on PC and Xbox, so it'd be low spec as well as high spec PC. Um, this approach is actually something I've used before in the past um, for Viva Piñata. Um, so, and if you look at the screenshot, I think it's aged really well. This was taken in 2007. Um, so, and I think it's part of the fact that there's a strong visual stylization to it that, that's meant that it's aged nicely. And that's the same thing I wanted to do with Sea of Thieves. So we had our two goals. We also had art challenges as well. I think these, everyone gets these with making games, you get some challenges that are just come along the way. But the first one was to capture the magic of a rare game. Now that sounds strange that I've just talked about capturing that magic and also had it as the art challenge. But the reason why it was a challenge is at the start of the project, it was going to be without any of the normal rare elements. So we, we thought we weren't going to have NPCs. We thought we weren't going to have a, have a story behind lots of elements within the world. Um, so I needed to work out how we were going to get that charm and that character within the, within the players and also the world surrounding them. The other challenge was um, it was going to be larger than any game we had made before. Um, right from the get-go, we knew that this was going to be a massive open world and something we hadn't done. And it was going to be a style of game we'd never made in an engine we had never used. So for this, we used the Unreal Engine, and it was the starting point. Um, so we needed to do some learning as well about it. At the start of the project as well, I did a lot of research. So I've watched probably every single pirate film that you could possibly do. It's not very easy to go out and pretend to be a pirate, so I've decided that was probably the best way to understand the theme, because we wanted something that embraced the tone of the world. Um, once that we kind of digested all that reference, we started work on the artwork itself. So these are some early examples of the concept that was uh, done for uh, the very inception of the project. So my background is that of a concept artist, so it's always my go-to at the start of a project, with most development it is. Um, and we've also got a great team at the studio that just jumped at the challenge of creating an adventure game. Uh, so we explored the islands and the, whether there was volcanoes, there was an early idea of what the edge of the world could be like. Um, and there, here's some early explorations into characters as well. So we were really trying to find the, the theme as well. We were trying to find what kind of pirates these were going to be, whether they were going to be um, heroic or the, when they were going to be dirty run pirates, which we ended up leaning towards. Um, or how um, characterful they were going to be, whether they were going to be really cartoony or whether they were going to be fairly realistic. Um, through all this work and all this concept development, we started to create the art pillars. So the art pillars um, 
we, with projects, there's always the overarching pillars of the project. There's always the design direction, the gameplay, the engineering, something that, that ties it all together. But I also like to create individual art pillars um, for the art team that sits alongside it and supports all of those themes. Um, and I like to create the art pillars based around the goals and the challenges that I've already mentioned. Um, so, and I also like to create the rule of three. So like with anything, three is always good. And if you're an artist, you know, aesthetically, three things together is a nice balance. Um, so this is the first pillar that defined the look of Sea of Thieves. So visual pillar number one is an illustrative approach. So in Sea of Thieves, we wanted to suggest structure and detail rather than define it. Um, granular noise is removed and replaced with a more expressive approach to textures. Um, these are combined with simple construction to create a rich and vibrant world. Um, so this pillar was created to create that timeless art style that I've mentioned earlier. Um, uh, so the simplification that I'm talking about is a good example here is where the, the silhouette of the forms are kept quite clean. Um, something I'm a big believer in is that um, you can get nice visual complexity through combining simplified forms. One problem that I've seen over the years, and, and I've done it myself, is as a concept artist, you'll create a nice uh, image and then you'll start extracting all those elements out and working up the design for each of those individual elements. And you end up pouring tons of detail within those elements and then sticking it all back together. And the, the final image is nothing like what you started with because you've just added so much noise into those individual elements when they're recombined. So here's an example of the do's and don'ts. So obviously that palm tree over there was uh, over on the left is very noisy. It's got lots of detail within the, within the bark. Where on the, on the right, it's far more simplified. There was something that I was, we were aware of as well, is that by um, simplifying the form, we would end up with a surface detail that could end up looking very tube-like or, or, or quite, quite a bit too simple, really. So what we ended up doing was looking at how we could add faceted surfaces um, within those details as well. So from a distance, the form would be fairly simple, and then as you get closer, you'd see a nice surface within the, within the um, objects themselves. Um, we also, from the simplified forms, we also wanted to capture an interesting aesthetic within the uh, textures. So it was inspired by um, concept painting where, it's, where you can get very brush marky and very expressive with a lot of the different um, elements within it. Um, it's, it's a way of making sure that the, the world is um, simplified but never flat because those textures have that detail level within it. Um, Another aspect of the uh, inspiration for this was by, I'm going to attempt the name, Kazuo-san, um, who he's a renowned painter of uh, background and layout for Studio Ghibli films. This one's from Spirited Away. I think a lot of people find um, Ghibli films quite inspiring and, and take a lot from it. The thing that I thought was really interesting was how the um, surface of the wall has lots of different values and hues within it, and there's also these brush marks. And around the, around the door, there's some nice, really defined, called out areas of wear and tear. And this was something that we wanted to try and capture within Sea of Thieves. Um, so for this, we did some early tests on texturing. Um, so an expressive texturing approach. You can see that the, the rock at the top and how it is at the bottom, and also how we're removing detail from the leaves. These were really early on, so we did evolve slightly from this, but it shows you the initial outset. The next image is when this started to all come together. So this is actually an image taken from a game capture with rend renders added to it and paint overs to try and stop pulling together that vision, to really try and define what it could look like. Um, here are some call outs to those areas within um, the brush marks, so the way the, the brush marks are on the palm or the um, palm tree trunk, and also the rocks. Uh, another aspect of the, the simplification that we were looking at was how we could um, reduce noise within blocks of color. So what I mean by that is that, the, for instance, if you look at the palm tree, you've obviously got that very big green top, and the trunk itself is made mainly from brown, brown notes and colors. Um, the same thing with the grass. It's got a quite a purity to it. Um, the idea around this is that you get a clean color read from each of those objects, so we're not spreading lots of different colors over a, uh, the trunk of the tree. It's not got green moss going up it. It's not blurring altogether. So the idea would be that if you actually do blur the image and it, um, blur the internal detail, it still gives you that read of, the, of that environment because it's, it's staying pure to it. So as an example of these rules in action, 
I'm show going to show you two images. So this is the first one. So that's one of the many chests that you can find in Sea of Thieves. So those of you who have played the game will have probably found this in the world and run around with it. And here's another version of that, that image. So for the keen eyes amongst you, you'll realize the first one is a concept art. And the second one is a 3D model. So this was the really kind of high five moment for us in the game. We'd really managed to achieve the ability to get that textures, the simplified look, the separation of the colors within the object. Um, so that was quite a key moment when we realized we could do this and this was the right approach. Um, another important part for me about um, creating illustri an illustrative approach was the way we treated lighting. So I like to think of it as painting with light. So it was such an important part to, of the world. We wanted the world to be vibrant and expressive, and we wanted the world to, ha to heighten the emotions when you're on the sea. So those storms that were dark and moody and those beautiful sunsets, they were all uh, derived to, to make you feel those emotions when you look at them. Um, and the inspiration for that came from looking at color keys um, found within 3D animation movies. Um, just love the way that they push the vibrancy within it and also where they're not hindered by overly realistic lighting. They, they do um, heighten it to make the emotion of that moment within the film. These images are from my favorite, one of my favorite artists, which is Nathan Falks. I really recommend you go and look at him. He's got amazing charcoal work and his color keys are phenomenal. So the ones down in the corner here, so there's um, two of the images are from Rio. Uh, the one in the bottom right is from Puss in Boots and the top one I think is from Spirit. But yeah, the, I just love the way that that works. And we wanted to capture a bit of that within the world. So here are first tests at doing that. So we were looking at the way that the light could change one environment, how by having those different color keys within the world, we can make the mood change. So these were the first early tests of that. Um, and here it is applied to a, a three-dimensional environment. Uh, so this was taken from my diorama. Um, and you can see that we were playing with the colors there again. And we were also looking at the way that weather changes a location. By having it rainy, um, you could f get a different emotion. I just looked out in the crowd. There was a, a one of our tech art directors was just smiling at me, because you can remember this from back in the day. Um, and this leads me nicely to what I'm going to show you next, which is um, the engine viz dev, um, or getting to know Unreal. So obviously, we needed to get to know Unreal as a studio. The art team had never used it before. Maybe some of them had, had, had used it in passing, but a lot of us had not used it for, to make a main game. Um, so we decided the best thing was, was to create a small diorama, a little chunk of land, where we could test out all these theories that I've been talking about. We could test the texturing, the simplification, um, and just some of the tech that we were playing with at the time. So I'm going to let that play for you now. So that was our first test um, to prove this all out. Um, as you can see, it contained a lot of interesting things within it with the simplification that I talked about, but it also create, had two elements that turned out to be really important for the game. Um, and also leads me quite nicely to my next art pillar, which is um, pillar number two, uh, a sea of motion. So um, in Sea of Thieves, clouds form and waves crash and also sails billow in the wind. Uh, the plants would sway in the bruise, breeze as well. From the swell of an ocean to the swinging of lanterns below deck, the world was never still. Um, this is especially uh, prominent in the water and also the sky, weather, and the passage of time. So this was really important to create that sense of a living world and that drama of being on a pirate ship sailing through the waves. Um, 
And it became quite obvious when you look at a screenshot of, of what the game looked like, and we could see this within the prototype early on, that there is a lot of water, there is a lot of sky. So that was going to be our world. It was a, a world where you could go to islands, but the player would see this a lot of the time. So there's a big chunk of boat as well, but if the player was to look to the right or to the left, they'd end up seeing this. So again, more sky, more water. Um, so we knew that this was going to be a really important part of the game. Um, so the sea was going, to, was going to be this big, powerful character within the world. We wanted it to be dynamic and also feel like its own entity. It had a power to force the player around in the world, so as their boat is crashing through the waves, um, triggering these emotions as you ride over the crest. And it also became one of our highest visual bars within the game. Uh, and it varied from appearance depending where it was in the world, so from calm lagoons to big storms to just the open sea. So there is an action. Um, so interestingly enough, I spent a, a quite a long time thinking about water and how stylized it should be within the world. Um, I did experiment with, with creating something more stylized, but realized that, um, that as soon as you start removing some of the essence of what water is from it, it just didn't feel like that element anymore. And you actually see that with, again, in animated 3D films, I'm a big fan of them, and you can see that water within it is often treated as realistic water. And the reason for that is because it just doesn't feel right if you, if you change it. Um, but we did add stylization to it, so it's fairly realistic in the way that it moves and it acts, but the way that the, the light cascades through it and also the tones and colors that we added to it, each of those things are hand done um, to create that sense of an expressive painterly kind of quality. Also, the sea foam as well has got a very defined pattern within it that we uh, repeat to, to crop kind of mimic the paint marks of the, that you find within the textures as well. Um, so there's the water, and now I'm going to show you another video which is, is just focused on the water, so enjoy our lovely waves. Everyone always says they're beautiful. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. We have got a great rendering team that put that all together, but it was, really was uh, a huge effort from um, both the rendering team, also the tech artists, the lighting people, and there were so many people involved in, in creating that. Um, so going back to that image, um, we'd sorted the water. We'd obviously, that, that's in the bag, but we'd got the big sky above it. Um, and we also knew that that wanted to be a character as well, as equally as powerful as the water. Um, so for this, we looked at lot, lots of reference to try and get inspiration. And through looking at this reference, it became quite obvious that we wanted this guy to be these, have these big, bold forms within it. Um, and them to almost have a sculptural quality. Um, they should grow and change and dissipate and even cast shadows across the environment. Um, the sky needed to not only create a, a sense of wonder, but also fear. The moment that you sail into a storm, how does that really feel? Um, so with that, we decided we needed to try something a little bit different, which was to create large geometric, geometry-based clouds. Um, so this was early concept for, for how that could look. And the idea was that um, I painted all these different big shapes out and, and looked at how they dis disappeared into the horizon also how that they um, would be really nice as you, as you sailed underneath them and they passed overhead. Um, this was how that they should look in the game in the sense that they were more fluffy and more kind of like expressive. Um, so that was the, the early exploration into that. Um, by having large geometry-based clouds, we also realized that we could do some quite interesting things. 
Um, maybe we could make a skull appear in the clouds, which would be quite uh, an interesting thing. And this was an early idea for Skull Island. We realized that we wanted to put a Skull Island in the game, but it has to be in every pirate trope. Um, but rather than have a big island carved out of a skull, um, we thought, how about having a big cloud above it? Um, this was an idea early on that actually got used later within uh, the development for something else. Um, who's attacked a skelly fort? Has anyone done that? So for those of you that don't know, as you, as you sail across the waves, you can see a big skull on the horizon. It's the sign that a skelly fort has, has appeared within the world, and you can go and battle the skeletons within it and maybe steal their riches. So again, I've got another short video to show you, which is um, the clouds in action. Here we go. We even had some really interesting fun te tests of putting um, the shape of a ship in the sky as well. So we really did just throw lots of things within it to see what would happen. Uh, this was, again, the, the tech art team put this together. It was a phenomenal piece of, of work. Um, alongside the, the, those clouds, the clouds of the water, um, I also wanted a world in which there was just that sense of movement within it. So I've mentioned those big, bold things, uh, but also the little things were important. Uh, this, the world needed to have a sense of, of life, and I think through those small little moments, it just shows you how, how, um, how kind of just it's peaceful to watch it just move. There was one moment where we didn't have the trees swaying in the breeze, and it, they just felt like concrete. And as soon as we turned it on and we actually got it in, they just started to really move, and it just felt so beautiful. Um, you almost kind of realised how much you'd missed it when it wasn't there. So um, I'm now going to. Um, as this is playing, I'm going to um, talk about something else that I'm going to share with you next, which is something we've never actually shared um, outside of the studio before, which is the Art CG trailer. So, um, right, really early on, um, we'd obviously um, we were developing the art style. Um, we had this prototype that was going to be rich with gameplay that was developing and really powering along, but we needed to prove out. Um, more of the, of the art style. We weren't actually building um, all of the world at that point, so we tested out on the small island, we created the rules, uh, we'd done a few art tests ourselves, and we needed to test those theories more. Um, so for it, we decided to create a, a CGI trailer, and we actually worked with a partner we've used several times in the UK, which is real time. Um, and to begin with, we'd started by just exploring more areas that could exist within this trailer. So we looked at islands, we looked at the clouds again, uh, we looked at what it would feel like below the ship, so um, how it's kind of all, all cosy and warm and also that close feeling compared to the outside. Uh, we looked at moments of finding areas of interest, such as a, an undead pirate captain that would be sitting on a throne. Um, we also started working on defining our characters even more. So this is the first three characters that really started to get that Sea of Thieves style. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why they have the Sea of Thieves style in a bit. Um, 
And through making this trailer, we were able to test things out, such as our lighting that I've mentioned, and also take some of our early uh, block out models of the ship and really work them up. Um, so for example, like this ship here. And we also looked at early aspects of what our first Kraken could look like. So there's some of the exploration about um, what a tentacle would look like. Um, through this process, I found it immensely useful. Um, we were able to prove out lots of different ideas and, um, and also give lots of different feedback, play around with the different approaches to things, look at the way we're treating decks of the ship, look at the way that we're um, building the world, look at the detail, even the angle of the ship and the twist of the ship, the way that it was um, made to feel a little bit rickety. Um, so I'm going to play that video now, but I'm not actually going to show you the full trailer. What I'm going to show you is parts of it and also some of the tests that were made through it, because I think that was the important part. It was proving out these theories. end on a bang. Um, so yes, yeah, so that, that was a, a really, really fun thing to do and I feel immensely lucky in my, in my job to be able to go and um, explore visuals like that. Um, so now we're going to come to one of our last pillars, which is a world of stories. Um, so as I mentioned before, we were going to be making this characterful rare game, but it was going to not have any NPCs in it, and it wasn't going to have any of the normal rare thing that we were going to have. We did get it. We did actually start adding it in. We realized how, how important it was to it. But right at the beginning, we needed to work out how to make that feeling come across through the entire world. Um, so we knew that uh, the pirates were going to have these really fun adventures, and they were going to have uh, really nice locations to go to and explore that would have this sense of story, have this sense of history within it. Um, but we also wanted to make that, that character and that story and that rare charm sing through every single aspect of the game. So for this, we made it so that every single item has its own story. Um, so as you can see, there's a, there's a shovel and a blunderbuss, and the way in which it, it has a sense of history to it. And this was applied to every single um, item within the game and every single part that we actually built. So nothing was new as well. So this is a, a fairly kind of shiny sword, but it has a sense that it's got chips in it, it's got dents in it, it's been used before. The idea was that you would have uh, stolen it from another crew or found it within the world. So everything in Sea of Thieves is secondhand. The idea of Sea of Thieves is, is this bubble of pirate adventure. So no, new, no one's making lots of new swords. They're fixing a lot of swords and, and bringing them in. So the three important aspects of creating this life story that, that really um, sang through, um, and that was wonky with logic, I will explain that, um, wear and tear, and patched and repaired. Um, so wonky, which turned out to be a kind of a cornerstone of conversations around the art direction, um, is this. 
Um, so wonky is a general term to cover distortion and disruption um, of surfaces uh, that have been caused by its history. So they can be poorly, poorly built, damaged, or even warped with age. Uh, there's an example of what, what it is and what it isn't. So um, it's amazing when you're doing stylized games how quickly it sometimes can just turn into quite, um, quite tropey, to want a better word, of cartoon, uh, cartoon stylized forms. So you can get a lot of stylish uh, pinches or distortions. And what I wanted to make sure was all of this wonky feel wasn't through just a skew items. It was through the fact that there was a history within it. So here are some examples of that. We have uh, the deck of the ship, uh, well, the, the stairs down. So the rail is warped with age, and it has this slight bow in it. And the steps are uneven and worn. Um, another example within the world is, oh, there's a crate. This is an example of it when it was done wrong. So uh, the crate, you can see on the left there, it just, no one would make a crate like that. It just feel, you couldn't stack them. They were just a fall all over the place. Um, it wasn't wonky. It was um, just cartoonic, cartoon distortion. The one on the left is a more Sea of Thieves -y crate in the sense of it was, it's been made out of a mismatched piece of wood. It's got the wear and tear within it. So they're the two examples of done right and wrong. Here's some more examples of the deck of the ship, the way that there's um, chips and dinks. And these are really an example of how much um, care and love we put into every single item within the world. Um, Another example is the, the, the beam of wood um, that's around the, the post that's around the captain's door. So rather than, if, if it just went in and it was flat geometry, it would feel over, overly uh, clean. But as soon as we started uh, knocking corners as if someone's ran through it with a treasure chest and knocked, knocked it around a few times, or even where there's a cut mark where a sword has been, have been slashed against it. These things all give a sense of history. So, uh, the wear and tear even expanded to the characters themselves. So uh, no matter how um, smart the clothing would be, so uh, the character on the, on the left there, she's got a, kind of like an admiral kind of clothing, but it's still patched and repaired. It's still got areas of dirt and wear. Uh, and that continued within all of the clothing through the game. Um, so we had holes and rips and, and torn edges. So the, again, this pillar tied into all of these, um, everything within the game. So more examples of it. Um, this was a term that we ended up using all the time as well. So there was wonky, there was dinks. If something never, didn't look Sea of Thieves, we'd normally say, make sure it's a little bit wonky and add some dinks, and it worked every time. Um, so I love it as a, as a system. Um, so again, you can see the chips and the dinks within the, the thing. So a skeleton's head to the clothing, to the swords, it really was something that just kept working. Another aspect of creating this sense of history within the world was patched and repaired. Um, so if you look at the deck of the ship, um, there are actual kind of like planks of wood that are, are, are right angles to what they should be. Now, I know every sailor would probably tell me this is not how you fix a ship. And I did have a conversation with someone on the team where they were going, you just wouldn't do that. Um, but it speaks to the fact that, I, I felt it spoke to the fact that these pirates were, didn't really care. They were just suddenly kind of dirty pirates that were just sailing around the world. So these ships needed to feel battered and worn. And this started to give it a little bit of that character within the deck of the ship itself. Also, the patched and repaired expanded to um, things like the sails, where we have patches on the sails. And we, we used a lot of wraps within certain items to show that um, it was shorn up for uh, stability. So the idea of that was that you could um, apply that to it and it would have that sense that it's been broken and a pirate picked it up, wrapped it up themselves, rather than take it to a blacksmith and they've fixed it. So it had that sense that it was out on the ocean waves having an adventure of itself. So these were the visual pillars uh, to ride from the goals. So from the, uh, the illustrative approach that we took to the uh, a world in motion and a world of stories. These were the three things that um, detailed the entire game and really guided our vision. These, these came together fairly early on uh, within the development, and they just kept helping us through everything. So every time we put something new in the game that we weren't sure about, a new material or a new substance, um, we were able to look at it and, and apply this thinking to it every single time, and it would instantly just feel like Sea of Thieves. Um, 
I've included this picture of World of Stories because this is something I, I didn't mention earlier on, but I thought it was quite interesting, is another aspect of World of Stories that we had is we actually um, put our players into the game. So when a player's done something particularly noteworthy on our forums, in the world, on Twitter, within the game, we often immortalize them within it. And this is the Georgian Kraken. So um, there's a character called Clumsy George on the forums, and he um, so was one of our players, and he um, wrote a story about fighting a kraken with a broom, and so we turned him into a tavern. So he got his own tavern in the game. So that's, again, so we're, we're adding history to, to the world all the time. So you can see that even from the smallest element within the world, these rules are applied. So from the way that uh, these small bolts, that, uh, or nails that got knocked into the wood and the way that they split the wood. That's the dinks, that's the wear and tear, that's the story. The way that the items all have that sense of history, from a broken hurdy-gurdy to a tankard to a blunderbuss, um, it all got applied. And to our characters as well. So um, here are the characters. So we were knocking teeth out, we were um, adding scars to them. Our system actually able, is enabled, enables you to create heroes within the world, but also um, dirty rotten pirates. And the idea was that I think there's enough lantern jawed heroes in games, um, so it's nice to be able to show the other side of it. Uh, from the skeletons that you fight as well, that you've seen earlier on with the, with the uh, breaks within the face and the dinks. And also those hidden moments of exploring within the world, like finding the secret of a, a sunken treasure, treasure ship. And the interesting locations like one of these ports, which it has a sense of story to it, like how did that ship get up there? It was obviously a big wave or a kraken through it. Um, so I'm going to finish up by showing you some interesting then and now moments. Um, that I talked about the prototype, and so I'm going to show you some pictures of the prototype and actually what it, what it looked like in-game. So um, the prototype continue, we continued working on the prototype for quite some time in the game, so it ended up where we were putting box models back into the prototype to represent certain of the game world elements. So this is one of our ports that you can explore, and this is what it looked like in the prototype, and this is what it looked like in-game. Um, and there's another one. So here's an island within the world. Uh, and this is what it ended up looking like. This is Shark Bait Cove with an interesting shark statue in the middle. Um, and you may get eaten by sharks if you go into the water. Uh, and also the deck of the ship, of course, important. Um, and that's what it looked like in game. So it was really fun doing all these things. Um, a really fun thing that I don't know if any of you have seen the prototype um, within some of the videos that we've actually released. The world was filled with Tic Tacs for a long period of time. <laughs> so uh, they always get a laugh. Uh, they populated everywhere. Um, the mermaid, if you've ever seen the mermaid uh, in our game, she pops up out of the water when your ship sinks and she comes to your rescue. Um, the mermaid form of her is truly frightening when she pops out of the water. This massive buoy of a, of a character pops up in front of you. Um, but that's what it looked like in game. So a few of the Tic Tacs have been hidden. Um, and finally, there's an island there next to, next with a ship. Um, and here it is in game. So this was a really interesting journey for us, making Sea of Thieves. Um, sea of Thieves, it's a game about a pirate crew in a shared world adventure with the freedom to choose their own adventure um, that speaks to the charm and playfulness of Rare. Um, so that's the end of my talk. And I'd just like to say thank you for coming today. And if you have any questions at all, please do let me know. Excellent. Hi, Ryan. Hello. Thank you very much, and congratulations for this release. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the lighting. Yes. Um, in your video, we see that the sun is almost on a vertical trajectory. Yeah. Is it still like that in the game? And if yes, is it a deliberate choice related to art or uh, technical issue? Uh, we played around with, with the way that uh, the sun I would have to think the, the technical artist that, that did it. We did actually ex uh, explore different configurations of it, and we decided that just worked for us. Really, okay. it was as simple as that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. Um, hello. Hello. Um, I, I just wanted to say this game looks absolutely beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, and I was wondering, because you talk so much about 
uh, putting history into like the items and yep. the characters. Uh, I was wondering what your process was for that when it came to uh, conceptualizing the islands, because there's so many different islands. Uh, did you like create an individual history for each of them, or? So we did, yes, we did create a theme. So to begin with, the, within the prototype, they were just designed to create the feeling, different feelings within it, whether it was a big valley or lots of different islands together. And then once we had those configurations of the landmass, we started to look at what we could do to, to create that sense of history. So for instance, there's an island called Snake Island, uh, and we started adding lots of uh, cave painting style things within it, and also uh, little artifacts and areas within it. So yes, it was each, the artist kind of, were given an island and tried to come up with a theme that they then could dress it. Um, we've also got a riddle system when you're solving adventures within the world. So you have to go around with a map and solve riddles and those riddles all tie to uh, those moments within the world that you can find. So it was key as part of gameplay and as well as the law of the world. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, sorry, I'm losing my voice. That's um, all right. So I wanted to make it known that me and my group, when we first got in, we like immediately lost our ship. And we, so we saw the merman, and we named him Marmin the merman. So I want to make that canon. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to talk Puns. to our writers. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, I want to know how you decided that there wasn't going to be a tutorial. Because that was like my favorite part of the game. Ah, um, that there wasn't a tutorial. Or, yeah. Yes. Like, um, that, that was born out of the fact that the prototype. Um, OK, so interesting story. Uh, so yeah, so the prototype was made, and we were just concentrating on the main mechanics. Um, and there was a big debate over how much of an onboarding there would be. Um, but there was a sense of trying to get discovery. So um, in the trailer in 2015 for E3, I think it was, um, we actually invited our whole bunch of, of uh, rare fans that, uh, or people that, that entered competitions to come and play the game. And we've got this test labs at the studio, and we put, put them all in a lab, and we didn't tell them anything. They didn't know it was a pirate game. They, they didn't, oh, maybe they did know it was a pirate game. Yes, they knew it was a pirate game. They didn't know what the mechanics were or how to play it or anything. And we just put them in the room. And then we all stood watching the th feeds going like, are they going to work this out? And they just started to work it out. They started to come together on the ship. They started to climb. And it was, I think it was that approach to creating um, tools and objects in the world that you could just understand to interact with. So the hope is that with a light bit of gentle prodding in the, in the general direction, um, people will f discover it themselves. And that was, uh, from talking with the designers, that was a key part that they wanted to try and get across. OK. And so like, how did you decide that that would be better? Because there's the risk of like, people immediately getting bored and like, oh, this game has nothing in it, when like, there's really like, yeah. a lot I more think it's, um, I think it's, it's good. we're going to look at um, feedback, obviously, from, from players as well to see what, what actually happens. Um, but I think there's a, there's a lot of people that appreciate it as equally need it. So we're going to weigh that up. And I think that's the, the thing. Thanks. First off, I just want to say your implementation of HDR is probably the best I've seen in any game so far. It is gorgeous on my big 4K TV. Cool. It's amazing. Um, it's a great rendering team. It is fantastic. <laughs> uh, I did have a question about uh, the transitions of the weather and the sky between biomes. Yes. It's fairly instantaneous. Like you could be a green sky and then it goes perfectly blue like yeah. 10 seconds later. Is that an intentional decision or is that something that's going to still be worked on in the future? Um, I think there are areas where it goes quickly. So it depends how, it really does depend how big the, the transition um, between the zones are. So we've actually shrunk some of those transitions down um, for gameplay. So we've actually brought the islands together and those zones together. So for those of you that don't know, Sea of Thieves is separated into three zones and there are big three, there's actually four different lighting zones within the world. There's a central neutral one. And we squashed those together. Um, so that's the way it is at the moment in the world, but we're continually improving. So now you've said that, I'm definitely going to go and check that out. Like just, <laughs> yeah, just anecdotally, like there's sometimes where you're like, you'll be sailing, and it's like, you're just coming out of a storm, and then it's like the sky is all green, and then like a split second later, it's like perfectly blue skies. It's like nothing dissipated; it just swaps. Oh, yeah. Right, I'm going to look at that. Yeah. That sounds like a bug. Uh, Thank you very much. Northeast side of the map. <laughs> right, we'll have a look at that. Yeah, thanks for the talk. It's really inspiring. Um, I'm curious 
was the timing of the launch just a coincidence with GDC? Um, or was it, that It planned? was just coincidence. I see. And I, I, I did debate whether I was going to do this. I was, um, Jeff actually um, invited me to come and, and do this talk, and I did sit at the studio going like, launch week, GDC. But it was an opportunity to, to be here and actually um, talk about the game so close to launch. It felt like a fun thing to do. And how did the launch go? Uh, exponentially, hugely well, uh, just massive. Uh, so we've got more numbers than we ever dreamed of coming into the game. Awesome. There's some ridiculous numbers, like 5,000 people a minute um, trying to enter the game. It's just crazy. So yeah, so very good. Awesome, congratulations. Thank you. And I think there's no more questions. So that's it. If anyone has got any other questions for me, um, I was actually told to remind you of one thing, which was the questionnaire that gets sent out an email to you. If you could fill that in, it's really helpful to the GDC organizers because they'll know what talks to put on next year. If you found this interesting, hopefully you did. Um, if you didn't, come and talk to me. I'll take the feedback anyway. Uh, and I'll be outside if anyone wants to have a chat with me about anything. Okay? Thank you very much. <laughs>